be talking about vision. Philippians chapter 3 is where we'll be. So you can go ahead and open your Bible to Philippians 3. If you don't open your Bible, you will be bored. Okay? The purpose of this is to see what God's Word says for us this morning. And I want to start with the story of Florence Chadwick. And here's a picture of her. She was the first woman to swim the whole English Channel, both waves. And in 1952, she stepped into the waters of the Pacific Ocean off of Catalina Island, determined to swim 21 miles to Palos Verde, California. And this is a story from Randy Alcorn. We hear of Francis, or Florence Chadwick swimming and swimming. The weather was foggy and chilly. She could hardly see the boats accompanying her. Okay, six or 21 mile swim. She swam for 15 hours. Then she begged to be taken out of the water along the way. But her mother, who was in a boat alongside her as she swam, told her she was close and that she could make it. Finally, physically and emotionally exhausted, she stopped swimming and was pulled out. It wasn't until she was on the boat that she discovered the shore was less than half a mile away. At a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. Vision is extremely important. If I could have seen the shore, I could have made it. And today, God has given us His Word. Right? And looking into His Word is our shore. Okay, this is our anchor, this is our compass, this is what needs to guide us in our lives and give us the purpose of why we're here, what we're called to do, and that is true vision. Okay, so we're going to be talking about vision, and as we start on your handout, I want you to ask yourself this question, a hard question. Are you more prone to think about the past, the present, or the future? What type of person are you? The past. Remember the good old days, how everything used to be. Is that you? The present. I'm just focused on right now. That's it. Don't bother me with the details about later. Just right now. Or the future. Okay? It's going to get better one day. This is just a really busy season. I'm going to get through this season. I'm focused on the future. Which one are you, honestly? What did your life show this week? So as we talk about joyful vision, we're going to look at two types of vision. But first, Helen Keller, famous for being blind and deaf, said, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. Sight but no vision is worse than being blind. And the first definition of vision is from the New Oxford American Dictionary. And that says that vision is a mental image of what the future will or could be like. Okay? And in, in God's Word, we see the prophets throughout the Old Testament. They're speaking on behalf of God to God's people, and often their role was to foretell the future. Okay, there's several hundred prophecies about Jesus in the Bible. You know, the prophet Isaiah told the future of, of the Messiah who was coming hundreds of years before Jesus came. So much that one church father called the book of Isaiah the fifth gospel because it just so clearly talks about Jesus' life. But vision, that ability to, to look forward and see what needs to be ha happening so that good things are done. Okay, and it's so encouraging to know people with this type of vision. Um, I even, last night, we were celebrating with some people from Doris Todd Christian School, and uh, if you go to Doris Todd School, and I, I had the privilege of teaching there in 2008, 2009, and there's... Uh, was, I, don't, I hope it's still there, on the wall, just kind of some details about Ed Todd's life. And Ed Todd was really a person of vision. He saw what needed to be done and didn't make an excuse. He made a plan and just got a lot of things done. He was a person of vision. People who know that, you know, if you're not growing, if you're not changing and adapting, you're probably dying. And it's important to know people with vision. Even Kukulani Baptist, I'm encouraged to hear stories of people who were movers and shakers, and the people who got the pews here a long time ago, and uh, got the preschool established, and getting through the building plan, and just different things. The people who were visionaries are encouraging to know. 
And it's cool to see the way that they've struggled and been faithful to the calling on their lives. Amen? Okay, so vision is important. And this first type of vision is that, that of foretelling and have, having that ability. Um, one more book of the Bible I'd encourage you to read this week is the book of Nehemiah. If you can read that with your family, Nehemiah is this incredible leader who weeps when the wall is broken down and doesn't make excuses. He makes a plan, and God uses him in an incredible way. Okay, and he's a person with that ability to just see what needed to be done and do it. But then the second type of vision, and this is where we're going to be really camping today, is seeing God's truth. And young people, adults, God's truth is like our shore. Okay, that when we see God's truth, when we see that, you know, God's word is right here talking about what's going on in our lives, that's what encourages us to keep being faithful doing the tax, tasks that God has called us to do. And this type of vision is not so much foretelling about the future, it's forthtelling about the present. Okay, being able to bring forth the truth of God's word and apply it to the present. Proverbs 29 verse 18 is where probably the, the main passage in the Bible that talks about vision. And in this context, Proverbs 29, 18 is talking about forth-telling. Forth -telling. It says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. Okay, another translation, where there is no vision, the people perish. Okay, where there is no prophetic word, the people cast off restraint. Okay, that prophetic word of God speaking forth, his word, is so essential to keep us faithful in the present. So this is what we're going to be looking at today from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And God's people throughout history, when they failed to keep God's word in front of them, they've wandered away from his truth. So go ahead and open to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to see three ways that vision will illuminate our lives today from this chapter. That it makes clear okay, and will ignite us to do what is right. Because we have the ability to see that we're almost to the shore, like Florence Chadwick. And we just need to keep being faithful. So look with me first at Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Okay, the Apostle Paul says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Okay, this is called the epistle of joy. We've done a lot of setting up the context the last couple of weeks. Paul's in prison, and yet... He's singing hymns unto the Lord and seeing amazing things happen. That's the kind of guy he is. And he's saying, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Okay, to continue to put God's word in front of you is not a big deal for the Apostle Paul. It's important and it's a safeguard. Okay, that this word is sufficient for everything we need to know about God, everything we need to know about salvation through Jesus, and everything we absolutely need to know about living in obedience to God can be found right here in these 66 books, in God's Word. So Paul says, to write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who, mut who mutilate the flesh. Okay? Dogs in the Bible were unclean animals. Okay? And the naughty Jews... Okay, who were real religious, the Pharisees, actually used this as a racial slur against the Gentile believers. Okay, those who were not part of God's chosen people, who were uncircumcised, unclean, they would call them dogs. And that was wrong. So the Apostle Paul is actually being really ironic here, and he's saying, followers of Jesus, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And he's talking about the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were those who were all about laws, all about rules, all about righteousness through their own strength and through their own skills and abilities. And Paul says, watch out for them. Okay? For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Okay? So in the Bible, and just, just setting up this, this backstory. God had a special relationship with the Jews. 
They were his chosen people to demonstrate what the favor of God looked like. And as they followed God, they were blessed. As they turned away from God, they were cursed. And the symbol, the sign of their relationship with God was what? It was circumcision. Okay, that on the eighth day, a good Hebrew boy, a good Jewish boy, would be circumcised because he was from a good family who wanted him to remember that sign that God had given them of his special covenant love and favor. But Paul's saying, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in our flesh. So the true followers of Jesus are not those who trust in their good works. Kukulani Baptist, it's not about how good of a person you are, it's about how good of a person Jesus is. And our confidence is in God, not in ourselves. And this is just such a neat prayer, okay, for not only Kukulani Baptist Church, but for Waipuna Chapel, Calvary Chapel, Pukanaz, all the different parts of our church, God's church up country, all the different parts of God's church on Maui and around the world, for us to pray this. Father, I pray that we would worship by your Holy Spirit and that we would bring glory to Jesus Christ and not put confidence in our flesh. That should be our prayer every morning coming to church. You know, that God would be glorified today. And it's not about the singing or about the preacher or about what exciting programs are going on. It's about glorying in Christ Jesus and putting no confidence in our flesh. That's how we really worship, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we're ever doing God's work and putting confidence in our flesh, or just being so caught up in our own experiences that we're bringing glory to ourselves instead of to Jesus, we're off track, and we need better vision for our lives. We need to bring glory only unto God. Okay, look at verses 4 through 6. I love this. Paul says, Though I myself have reason for such confidence in the flesh also... If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Okay, so Paul is aware of what God has done in his life. He's aware of his background, and he uses even his mistakes as part of his ministry. Okay, he uses who he used to be to show God's transformation in his life, and he uses that to encourage others to worship God. So he's going to go through his rap sheet, his resume. Okay, he says in verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He knows who he is and what tribe he's even from. Okay? Here in Maui, a, a lot of people take great pride in being Hawaiian, right? Okay? And be, if you're able to trace your ancestry back and you're 100% full Hawaiian, that's something, in a sense, that, or that's something a lot of people are very proud of. And in a similar way, God's chosen people, it was an honor to know who they were. And Paul, he wasn't Papa Hebrew, okay? He knew what tribe he was from. He wasn't a Howley guy. He was fully part of God's chosen people, even probably named after the first king of Israel, King Saul, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, he was a Pharisee. That was a big deal. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, he was blameless. So this is just a stout resume of worldly accomplishments for the Apostle Paul. And just a reminder, as we're studying God's Word today, the fourth discussion question on your handout is what verse jumped out at you in Philippians 3? And I want this to be a Bible study where you let God's Word come alive to you. And if there's verses that jump out at you, maybe you want to underline them in your Bible. Maybe you want to write in the margins, but especially... Write down on the handout. Come back to God's word. We want to remember it. Okay, Paul had an amazing resume. Okay, this is like a student, just valedictorian, going to the Ivy League school, getting the best job, working faithfully, just having the Mercedes, having all the worldly status of this life. Okay, but listen to what Paul says about it. Moving on. Verses 7 through 9. He says, whatever gain I had, whatever was in the profit column on his balance sheet of life, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So it's not in the black, it's in the red. Okay, whoop de doo worldly accomplishments. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth 
of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. So it's not about Saul. It's not about his good works. It's about God's amazing work in Saul that transformed him into the Apostle Paul. Gave him a new name, a new heart, a new identity. And now all of those worldly accomplishments are the equivalent to a steaming pile of poop. Honestly, that's the word. It's dumb. Rubbish, some translations say. And it's a gross word. It's not an appropriate word necessarily for Paul to even write. But he's saying that it's so bad that I've placed my confidence in my accomplishments that it's like a pile of poop. Okay, the Bible also calls our righteousness filthy rags, which is the equivalent of used menstrual garments. Okay, really gross terminology, but that's how gross it is when we just put our confidence in our paychecks and our confidence in what people think of us and how many friends we have on Facebook or how great we are at our lives. Okay, it's rubbish. And we count it all as loss compared to knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord. Is that you this morning? Okay, is God's is knowing God giving you your purpose in life today? Or is it really, are you just trying to add on a little religion, add on a little bit of, of uh, faith so that you can be blessed and really just get more status and get more stuff for yourself? It's a hard, hard question. And when we mess up, we don't give up. We fess up and let God transform our lives. But really pray. Ask God to reveal His truth to you this morning. And may we worship by the Spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Okay, next, when we really have vision, we are illuminated for God's plan for our future. God's plan for our future. Who wants to know God's plan for your future? Okay, that would be pretty helpful, right? The God who made the heavens and the earth, who makes amazing sunsets, who makes the waves, to know what His plan is for your future. Look with me at this ver at verse 10. The Apostle Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's heart is to know Jesus. That in the future, you know, heaven is really the presence of God. And Paul gets to know Jesus now and get to experience God's resurrection power in his life now and have hope for the future. Okay, he wants to know God. That's his heart's desire. Do your prayers look like that? Or are your prayers more, you know, God, I don't have a lot of energy today. I don't feel good. God, I just pray for all these sick people. That definitely should be part of our prayer requests. But... We need to know our God. We're in Christ. We have a relationship with Him. That is true joy. That is what's going to give us the strength to be faithful in this life now. Even to the point of sharing in Christ's sufferings. Paul's saying, you know, if it lets me know Jesus better, I want to suffer like Jesus. And nothing is ever wasted with God. That We know in God's plan for our future, He will waste nothing. Every experience we have is for preparation for something else. And our suffering, Romans 5 says, produces character. Our, our suffering develops perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces for us what? Hope. That we have hope. James 1 says, count it all joy when you suffer and face trials of many kinds. For the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Church, we need to know God's plan for our future, and that plan is for us to know Him, that we would know Christ. And that's Paul's heart, that's his prayer. 
And that's what drives Paul on. And then verse 12 through 14, he's going to tell us to press on. He says, not that I have already obtained this. Okay, he's still alive in this earth. He gets to experience Jesus, his resurrection power. But he's not perfect. Paul is not perfect. But he presses on to make being known by Christ, being mature like Christ, his own. Because Christ Jesus made him his own. Okay, so basically, we love because he first loved us. Okay, we're able to work, we're able to do what we do, because God's first worked in us. God's first done a work in us. So that's why we do the work we do. Verse 13, and this is the, the foretelling part of the vision. You know, foretelling, God's truth, he's speaking it, but now look at this. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, press on. He has a mission to do. Hebrews 12, 2 says, let us run with perseverance this grace marked out before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And let us throw aside the weights and the sins that easily entangle us. You know, we're all born by nature as sinners. And we're all born by nature, and we all make choices to commit sin. So we're sinners by nature and by choice. And yet, when Jesus transforms our lives, and we become new creations in Him, He gives us a new nature, new desires, and now we throw aside that old way of life. And you know, some of that nature can include same-sex attraction. It can include alcoholism. It can include all kinds of different perversions of God's gifts. And by God's grace, we throw aside those sins as we look unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, God's plan for our future is no longer being defined by the sins that we've committed. And you can write that in. That's not our identity anymore. What we've done. What kinds of sins we've committed. It's not even our identity any longer. What kind of sins have been done to us. You know, even that those who have been raped or those who have been treated terribly, their identity is no longer just a victim. But they're new creations in Christ. And we get to forget those things which are past and press on toward those things which lie ahead. That's God's plan for your future. To know Him and press on toward those things which lie ahead. Look at verses 15 and 16. I love this, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm a little bit of a nerd. But uh, if you look at verse 12, Paul's going to connect this. Okay, Paul's saying he's not mature, he's not perfect, but he's pressing on. And then, then he says in verse 15, Let those who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So he's saying, we're not perfect, and if you think you're, and if you're really on your way to being perfect, you realize you're not perfect. Okay, so he's just, he's saying, you know, those who are mature realize their immaturity. You know, those who really have experienced a lot, who really know the most, realize they don't know that much. And Paul's saying, only let us hold true to what we have attained. And uh, I like this too, he moves forward, he goes, just going back to verse 15. Let those who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So sometimes the most dangerous thing in seminary is those students who are taking their first year of Greek. Okay, because they, they're learning the Bible in the original language, so they start to think they're know-it-alls. Okay, and then the, by the second and third year, once they're really getting that knowledge of God, hopefully they're getting more humility, realizing how much they have left to know. Okay, so God's plan for our future, to know Him, to really know Him. And I've got a beautiful wife, Nicole, I love her so much, she turned, she turned 28 today, okay, and uh, love transforms our lives. Okay, if I said, man, I've got a beautiful wife, Nicole, and I love her so much, but then I go home and beat her, or I look up pornography on the internet and don't repent, don't confess that to her, after I confess it to God, or, or if I um, spread bad rumors about her behind her back, but I say she's such a beautiful woman and I love her so much. Okay, my life
life and my lips are going to be lying. It's not telling the same story. Okay, love transforms our lives. And furthermore, it's not just knowing what she likes. It's not just knowing her desires. It's actually fulfilling her desires and doing what she likes. Right? In that relationship with Jesus, the worst thing you can do is just learn about a lot of stuff this morning. And then not act on it. And not let the love for God change the way that you live. So I can learn how to say everything that uh, she says to me that she would like. I can learn how to write it all out in Greek. And I can memorize it. But unless I fulfill her desires, that's worthless, right? Okay? And we need to do what the Lord desires for us to do. God's plan for our future is to truly know Him. And we can never, ever have knowledge of God that's divorced from a relationship with God and a relationship with people. So the richer our theology is, our study of God, our knowledge of God, the greater our love for God should be and the greater our love for people should be. Amen? Okay, it's not something that should divide us, not something that should cause us to bite and devour one another. It's something that should cause us to rejoice in how amazing God is and then live it out, ignited by joy in Him. Okay, so God's plan for our future. And we get to nerd it up a little bit more today. Um, if you look on your handout, there's going to be some understandings of God's will in the Bible. Okay, if you flip your handout over, um, God's will. Anytime we talk about God's plan for our future, we need to talk about God's will. And what is God's will? Do you want to know God's will this morning? Okay, I for sure want to know God's will. And I'm not an artist, by the way, by any means. But I love you guys, so I'm going to try. Um, the first thing we learn about when we, when we look at God's will is really God's work. Okay, so you can write this in the blank on your handout. That God's sovereign purpose, His work, is the first and foremost thing we see about His will. His desires, His purposes... Um, for example, creation. This would be an example of God's work. Okay, He didn't make sure He got all of the votes from the Electoral College before He created the earth. Okay, He didn't check with the committee. He did work. What God starts is going to happen. What God starts, no one can stop. And His work in creation is that first part of His will. Um, when man fell, when man chose to sin, separated themselves from God, Genesis 3.15, God had a plan to send Jesus to this earth, that from the seed of the woman would be one to crush the head of the snake. And who is that? Jesus. Who is that? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, that Jesus' work is not going to be stopped. Okay, God's work in creation, God's work in Jesus will not be stopped because it's God's sovereign hand fulfilling God's sovereign plan. Okay, and I like this verse. Um, you don't have to turn there. You can if you hold your place in Philippians 3. After Jesus died and rose again, there's like riots happening cra or crazy things happening and uh, a lot of Christians are getting arrested and Peter stands up in the middle of a big group of people and starts preaching. Okay? His identity is not that he was a coward, that he denied Christ. When he messed up, he didn't give up, he fessed up. And now Peter is Pastor Peter. Okay? And he's preaching this awesome sermon. In Acts 2.23, in the middle of this, he says, Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Okay? According to God's work, Jesus, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Okay, so in some mysterious way, they're still responsible for crucifying Jesus. That God's sovereignty, His, His work and control and man's responsibility, that our choices, they go together. It's like two pedals on a bike. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. God works and controls all of our lives. And His work is His will, and it will not be stopped. So God's plan for our future. First is God's work. Next Within God's work are God's ways. God's ways. Okay, and this includes the Ten Commandments. 
And you can write in that it includes the Ten Commandments. It includes the greatest commandment. And that greatest commandment it is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, those are God's ways that we walk according to what pleases the Lord. And if you look with me, there's, um, God's ways are so clear in the Bible. Okay, they're not easy, but they're so clear. God's will is not a mystery. And if you get a chance, John MacArthur in 1980 preached this awesome sermon called God's Will is Not a Mystery. Or God's Will is Not a Secret, actually. And uh, it just really unpacks God's will in a very thorough way. He's a better Bible scholar and teacher than I am. But look that up on Google. John MacArthur, God's will is not a secret. But God's ways are so clear. And here are some passages that talk about God's ways. We had the youth memorize this at camp this summer. Ephesians 5, 17 says, Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be foolish. Don't be stupid. Is what he's saying. Understand God's will. Understand God's desires for your life. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That in order to glorify Jesus with your life and do God's will, you're going to walk in His ways, filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and part of walking in His ways is don't be drunk with wine. If you're drunk tonight, and you feel like God's really telling you to do something, He probably isn't. <laughs> okay? Don't call that person. Okay? That's, that's not walking in God's ways. Okay? It's contrary to His will. Okay? Furthermore, look at Romans 12.2. It says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Okay? So don't be drunk tonight, church, because that's conforming to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay, that as we walk in God's ways, we're within God's work. We're fulfilling God's will with our lives. Okay, that God's ways are within His work. Okay, another really important passage, and we talked with the youth about this Friday night, and uh, it was really neat. Had good discussion with the youth. What's the will of God? Sometimes we walk around. I don't know what the will of God is. I'm so confused. I'm just so confused. Well, keep your pants on unless you're married. Okay? For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That sexual acts and sexual thoughts are a gift from God to be enjoyed in the covenant relationship of marriage between one man and one woman. If that's God's gift, that is His will. That's how to walk in God's ways. Okay? So, as we look, God's plan for our future and God's will we see his work, what he's doing, what he do, what, what he does, can't be stopped, his ways, how he's called us to live, and last, this little circle in here, okay, is God's will, okay, his secret will for our lives, okay, or his hidden will, okay, and this is what so often we get so focused on and so stressed out about, but this is the, the four W's, okay? Who, what, when, and where. Okay, who do I marry? Okay, I want to make sure I marry the right person. When do I work on my education? Okay, when do I buy a house? Those types of questions. Where do I buy a house? Where do I send my kids to school? What church do I join and be a faithful member of? And who, what, when, where. Those things are important, but you know what's really important to God? That we walk in His ways. That we're faithful to walk in His ways. And if you're really walking in God's ways, if you're obeying the Ten Commandments, actually if you're just obeying the greatest commandment, that you're loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you're loving your neighbor as yourself, then you don't need to stress out about God's secret will. If you're not violating His revealed will, then you don't have to be stressed out about violating His hidden will. And you need to be faithful to what God's called you to do now. Okay, and 
This is important for us to see James 4, 13 through 17. Okay? This is the passage that a lot of times gets misinterpreted. Okay? It's talking about boasting about tomorrow, boasting about worldly gain and worldly possessions. And James says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Okay, these people have their, their life planned out in pen, not pencil. Okay, they, they plan it out and they know exactly what their desires are. And these aren't Christians. Okay, that James is actually discussing rich people who don't know the Lord. Okay, who love money, not God. And he's saying, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? This is like Ecclesiastes. You're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. This is vapor. That's it. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So we need to have a heart to do God's will. And that will is walking in His ways. He desires for us to walk in His ways. And we need to pray and plan. And I would write that in. Pray and plan that, God, if it is your will, and it's hard to punctuate your prayers with that. That's biblical. God, I'd really like this job. I'd really like to marry this person. But only if it's your will. God, please keep Pastor Paul healthy. Please give Pastor Paul a new kidney. But we pray for your will to be done. And it's follow God, pray to God, trust in God, and pray if it is your will. So that secret, hidden will is just such a small part, but we need to focus on God's work, glorify Him, focus on God's ways, obey what He's revealed, and then you know, punctuate our prayers. Lord, if it's your will, let it be done. But don't stress so much about violating God's secret will if you're obeying His revealed will. Okay? And Proverbs 6, 6-8 six says, Go to the ant, O slugger, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in harvest. Okay? And sometimes we make up spiritual sounding excuses to be a slugger. Okay? I don't know if I will go shopping because it might not be the Lord's will. Okay? And uh, instead, we need to work, you know, make money, shop, prepare, have food, be faithful, be obedient. Okay? If your roof leaks, Ecclesiastes um, chapter 10, verse 18, says it leaks because of your laziness. Okay? And idle hands make the rafters sag. That we have a responsibility to... To work and be faithful. And sometimes we make these spiritual excuses to be a slugger, but the Lord never calls us to be lazy. Amen? The Lord calls us to be faithful. Okay. So, last thought on this second point. You guys still with me? Okay. I love this stuff. I know it's hot in here, but God's Word is so good. And one church historian, church father, St. Augustine, Okay? Incredible life, incredible testimony. He's famous for saying, love God and do as you please. That if we really love God, we really follow after God, then, you know, marry the person that God's called you to marry. You know, don't download porn on the internet. You know, follow God's ways for your life. And if you're following God's ways, test it with wisdom and get married if He's called you to get married. Buy that house. If if it's financially responsible for you. You know, it's not so much don't miss God's secret will. It's love God and do as you please. And Psalm 37, verse 4, says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will put in you, give you, the desires of your heart. Okay, that you're a new creation in Christ. It's not just a duty. We walk through this life. I don't want to do this, so it must be God's will. Okay? It's that we delight ourselves in the Lord, and it's joy that causes us to live this life. God puts in us new desires, and then we're able to love God and do as we please. We realize God's plan for our future as we fully follow Him. So look back with me, verse 16. Let us hold true to what we have attained. 
Let us hold true to God's word, to, to the work that God's done in our lives. Let us not forget what he's done. And Paul does say he's forgetting those things which are behind, pressing on toward those things which lie ahead. But we see he hasn't totally forgotten those things which are behind. He realizes he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He realizes who he was. And yet he's forgetting that he, he's leaving behind his identity in those things. And he's pressing on toward those things which lie ahead. And he's holding true to that. So finally, we see God's power for our present. God's power for our present. He says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Okay, Paul's life was incredible. Okay, if you see the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 27, okay, his rap sheet, that he was beaten with rods, that he was stoned with rocks, that he was shipwrecked, that he was bitten by a snake, and he was still faithful to God, that's incredible. And he wasn't walking around putting fleeces out on the ground saying, God, I don't know if you want me to be a missionary. He wasn't looking for symbols and signs. And uh, he didn't get on the boat and say, I want to be a missionary, I think, but I don't know if it's your will. And then when the boat was shipwrecked, he didn't say, oh, it must not be your will, God, because it must not be your secret will. I don't want to miss your secret will. He was faithful. That's his example. You know, he wasn't... He, he, was, he was faithful even in difficulties, even in a lot of work. He persevered. At 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 27, it's crazy to see how faithful he was. And he didn't turn aside from his mission. We all have a mission. Okay, remember your leaders. Um, Hebrews 13, 7 says, Those who spoke you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Okay? Verse 17 of Philippians 3, Paul says, basically, follow me as I follow Christ. And he's saying, remember Epaphroditus? You know, don't be like those Judaizers who are finding their good works and their own accomplishments and celebrating that. You know, be like Epaphroditus who saw a problem. He didn't make an excuse. He made a plan. He was a messenger and minister. That was last week, but Epaphroditus. So think of these different men who we can imitate, these different women who we can imitate. You know, I, I still, I love seeing godly stay-at-home moms that are faithful to love God and love their family and build their home more than their resumes. I think that is so noble and awesome. And that's not what God calls all women to do. And yet it is, God does call all women to build their home more than their resume. That that's got to be the focus. Homeward-centered women, Titus 2. And we need godly examples in order to see what that looks like. Okay, and Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. We need godly examples in our church. And, you know, dig into this stuff this week. Research it. Don't just leave it behind. Wrestle with God's word. But look around at those who follow God's word. Verses 18 and 19, Paul says, For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with their minds set on earthly things. Okay, Paul realizes that people are going to hell. Okay, some people, this earth is their earthly heaven because they're deceitful and they make tons of money and have heaven on earth, but that's the closest to heaven they'll ever get. And yet Paul is not gloating over that fact. He's not celebrating that, oh, they're going to hell one day. Okay? In fact, he has tears that they're missing out on God's best for their lives because their God is their belly, because their appetites physically, sexually are destroying them. So what verses are, are jumping out at you this morning? You know, their God is their belly. They, their glory is their shame. How many girls they've slept with, how many drugs they've done, how many crimes they've committed. Have you heard people boast about that? Listen to the radio. People are glorying in their shame. And it doesn't lead to life. But following God, we have His power in our present. The resurrection power of Jesus is here with us in our present. Okay? Last couple verses, verses 20 and 21. Paul says, But our citizenship is in heaven, 
and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Okay, Paul is heavenly minded. He's focused on the fact that Jesus is coming back, and because of that, he's also earthly good. Okay? God's power is demonstrated in the present life of the Apostle Paul. You know, his vision to see God's word and to realize his mission, that he holds fast to that as his anchor and his compass, helps him continue and not give up the faith. It helps him be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in God's word. And we need that same vision, that same passion. And we only get that by looking at God's word. So are you seeing God's truth today? You know, it's, it's worth it. It's worth putting in the work, putting in the labor to understand what God has for us through his word. So discussion question this week, how you can continue to obey the word. Write this in. How do you now see that God's hand was at work in your past? No, I think it's so weird. I was this rebellious skater kid, and then I end up on staff with Pastor Paul and a bunch of police officers at our church. <laughs> you know? And God just works in our lives and transforms us. And He doesn't waste any experiences. How have you seen God work faithfully in your past? What have you seen Him use? Next, what future detail of your life, for example, a relationship, a job, a health issue, do you need to trust to God today? You need to say, God, this is a secret. I don't know what's going to happen. But help me to walk in your ways this morning. By the way, I stole this from Stephen Furtick. It's on your handout. I gave, I gave him credit. Okay? That's not original with me. I'm not plagiarizing. But it's on the handout. That God's work, God's ways, and God's will. But I really recommend the John MacArthur sermon on that. Because it's just so helpful uh, that God's will is not a secret. But what future detail do you need to trust to God? And then a couple more. What way is God calling me to live faithfully in the present? Okay, the, the host home in Han of the lady we stayed with said, I think of it as God gave me a present and I open it. And I'm faithful to that present. And I like that. So good. How's God calling you to be faithful in the present? And then what verses are you challenged by in Philippians 3? This is vision for next week, Philippians 4. Up there. Okay, but... Philippians 3. And last, in what ways has God helped you see vision lived out in the lives of Jesus, others, and yourself? You know, people that have really faithfully seen God's call on their lives and honored Him. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Teenagers, I hate seeing you guys worship rappers that just are getting girls pregnant and being terrible dads. Or athletes that are just terrible role models off the court. Okay? We need to consider the outcome of their ways of life. And we need to have people who are godly examples. So Jesus' vision, you know, and others, how they obey Jesus' vision. And then in our own lives, don't forget what God's done in your life. Celebrate that. I'm going to call the worship team up to start playing. And we're going to close with the reminder of Florence Chadwick this morning. <laughs> 